when Marika starts. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Answers that go. question. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce Marika Eiley to you. Um, Marika is what's known as a wild bee educator. And she knows a lot about our native bees and how bees and plants interact and how the land can be improved to support bees. She is the stewardship coordinator and an educator with the Environmental Youth Alliance. And she manages their native plant nursery in the downtown east side. She's also a director of the Native Bee Society of BC, which is an organization I urge you to join if you're interested in learning more about wild bees. I um, joined a little over two years ago, I guess, and I really enjoy the newsletters and the AGMs and the workshops that they put on. Really a great organization. So with that, I'm going to let Marika take over and begin the workshop, but welcome Marika. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to mention my my cat River really loves Zoom presentations. Yes. So you may, <laughs> may see him like blocking my face from time to time and just popping in. Um, so yeah, this is River right here. Okay, um, I am going to, oh, it looks like I need some access to share my screen. Uh, Brian, you have to make your co-host. Yeah, sorry about that. Totally, okay. totally, totally forgot. Uh, yes, there we go. Apologies, Marika. Okay, no worries. Here we go. So, <laughs> okay, hopefully this shows up. Okay, ah, yep, here we it. go. Everyone can see. Yep. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to start things off with the first bee pun of the night. I am very grateful to be here today. Um, and yeah, I, I um, am tuning in today from Musqueam territory. Um, and yeah, I'm, I feel very honored to share some of my learnings and teachings about native bees with you all. Um, and I'm curious, does anyone recognize this flower um, in this first photo? Dandelion. Oh, close. Uh, it is in the Aster family. This is our Puget Sound gumweed, and we have a dianthidium uh, relative of um, the wool carter bees here. Um, one thing is I, I hear a bit of an echo. Could we just make sure that folks are muted? Yes, that, that, that's fixed it. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so here we go. So here's a little photo of me in my happy place. And just to share um, a little bit of history, I first became really enamored with bees about a decade ago, and many of my learnings um, <clears throat> have been rooted in Western science um, through my university education, as well as books and resources and community workshops. Um, I feel really honored to have learned a lot of these teachings, but um, something I also want to acknowledge is that even though the Western science is, a, is such an um, immense source of knowledge for us. I also wanted to uh, recognize that traditional ecological knowledge is also a really wise way of knowing that is so um, deeply rooted in our land and um, has been passed down for so many generations. And um, unfortunately, on my journey thus far, I still haven't encountered many traditional teachings about wild bees. Um, so I, I want to acknowledge that I still have so much to learn um, when it comes to bees. So I'm, yeah, I, I'm grateful to be here to share what I do know and to also hear from other folks here what their, um, their learnings about bees are. Oh, someone's in the waiting room, I'll let them in. <laughs> Okay, so I'd just like to do a little uh, plug for the two different organizations I work with. 
Um, as Victoria mentioned, the Native Bee Society, we're a collective of many naturalists as well, lots of scientists and educators and land managers working to um, promote and protect wild bees in our province. Um, we have lots of different offerings that may be of interest to folks in this community, um, including bee walks and online events. Um, we also recently uh, kicked off our monthly bee study group. So that's a really wonderful place to bring um, any bee sightings or photos that you have and to get feedback from some of our um, taxonomists and And another program that's a great complement to that group is the Master Melatologist Program. This is run out of Oregon State University, um, but we actually have our own BC cohort. So uh, that, that's a great complement to the monthly bee study group. And the Master Melatologist Program is a way to dive deeper into learning about the different um, genera of bees. And many of the bees we see here are also really common in Oregon. So um, it's a great way to, to learn and dive deeper. And also EYA, this is um, my weekly, my day of the week job. Um, I work with lots of youth in the downtown east side and we do land-based education and stewardship and um, lots of different work around making medicines and uh, sharing teachings about plants and wildlife with our youth. Um, and we also run employment programs as well as educational programs for youth facing barriers. And for folks here, something you might be interested in is our annual native plant fundraiser where we put together bundles of native plants um, for a small donation to the society. And that really helps support our work. Okay, so here's a quick overview of uh, the different themes we're gonna cover today. We're gonna start off with a game uh, that really will root us in an understanding of how to tell apart bees and their common lookalikes, which tend to be wasps and flies. And next we're gonna dive into the different groupings of native bees or the functional groups. And uh, finally, I'll wrap up with some different ways you can get engaged as naturalists and, and learn more and dive deeper into native bee identification. Okay, so to start things off, I'd love to invite folks to just pull out a little piece of paper or even on your phone, you could jot this down, but um, take a look at these different numbers and insects on the screen and see if you can figure out which of these are bees. I'll give everyone 30 seconds. And we're also gonna visit this slide again at the end of the bee or not a bee game. Okay, I'll give about 10 more seconds. You can comment if that um, if you need a little more time. Okay. And yeah, if you have any questions about any of these insects, I can also try my best to answer them at the end as well. So time to dive into our game. And before we uh, look at the next few slides, I want to acknowledge um, the Spencer Entomological Collection, who's based at the BD Biodiversity Museum. And all of the photos, most of the photos in this game were from, uh, are from the Spencer Entomological Collection. Oops, I realized I typed it wrong there. It's Spencer with a C. Um, and that's a really important thing to note because you'll notice that the photos of, of the insects they're not, they're not living creatures. And you'll also see different um, relics of uh, the fact that they're, they're stored in a, um, an educational or in, in, a, um, in a scientific collection. Um, you'll see, you might notice the gold pin, or you might also notice just different positionings of the, the legs and the wings. So just keep that in mind as we move through the slide. And I'll try and point out um, different aspects that might be confusing in regards to that. 
Okay, so here is our first insect. And um, I'm going to invite folks to reflect, yeah, uh, whether this is a bee or not a bee. And um, let's start the poll. So take a look, think of your, um, take your best guess. Do you think it's a bee? Do you think it's not a bee? Um, Brian, are you good to get the poll kicked off here? Yep, yep. I'll uh, kick off the first question in the poll. Okay. okay. And um, one thing to point out, I'm not, can, I, can everyone see my cursor? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this here, as I mentioned, is a pin. So this isn't part of the insect, just so you know. Okay, right. So we're doing bee, fly, or wasp because we're a little more advanced here. So see if you can, um, yeah, take a good guess if you think it's a bee, fly, or a wasp. Looks like we have about nine more votes. Let's give it about five more seconds. Yep. Four. Okay, okay, I'm going to end the poll. And this is great to see. Um, so one, a couple people thought it was a fly. A few of us thought it was a bee. Um, the correct answer is this is not a bee. It is in fact a wasp. Um, so this is one of our common types of social paper wasps, um, the, the types of friends that are likely to visit our picnics towards the end of the summer season. They um, consume my... Go ahead. They can, what was that? I, I oh, sorry. My, my mic's off. They consume <laughs> my mother's walls. Oh no, they've moved into mother's walls. Yeah. And they come and they're gone. But they were humongous. Wow. Yeah. Okay. They're they're yeah, the wasp, these paper wasps are the are the types of wasps that us humans usually have the most types of encounters with. Um, but there are many, many different kinds of wasps out there that look quite a bit different than this as well. Okay, so that one I'll let you know was a pretty easy one. So we're on to the next one here. Take a close look. Oh, I forgot to share the results. Sorry, these are our results of the last one with our wasp here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, let us open up the next poll with this slide. Um, you want me to do that? There we go. Yes, yeah, we okay. just pop it up again. Okay. And a couple things to note. So this white blob at the top is actually a little piece of paper that the wasp is glued to. Um, also, oh, the insect is glued to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Um, and you'll see that its head is actually tilted down. So its eyes are a bit conspicuous in this photo. And uh, the wings are a bit folded, as we can see. Okay, I think a few people might be changing their answers here. <laughs> have my little slip there. <laughs> okay, we have about 10 folks left, so let's give it five more seconds. Bee, fly, or wasp. Okay, so. Our results here were most of us felt this was a fly, and um, six of us thought this was a wasp, and a few of us thought it was a bee. And the answer is this is not a bee, and it's not a fly, it is in fact a wasp. Um, so I'd love to hear in the comments, like, what for folks that did think it was a fly, like, what are some of yeah, what made us think it was a fly, this, this insect? You can write it in the chat. Probably the color. I, I would have chosen fly, just maybe the color. The color. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The things on the top of the head. Right. So you see these, is that those two dots you're talking about? The orange ones right here? It's, it's or the up. antenna? That, yeah. These? Okay, so yeah, here we have the antennae sticking up and 
we'll learn a little bit more about fly antennae soon. Yeah, so that's good to know. And we're gonna dive a little deeper into this um, in a little bit. Oh, can't see a wasp waist. You're right, it's a little hidden by the wings here, but those are very good thoughts. And we're gonna dive into them, into this a little bit deeper in the next few slides. But before we do, I'm gonna introduce one, another insect here for comparison. So, oh wait, oh, we yep. already shared, oh, okay. Oh. Sorry, let's, I already shared. Okay. We already shared it. Yeah. So okay. let's start a new poll. Okay. Here's another insect here. Bee, fly, or wasp. What do we think, folks? Ooh, this is probably our most evenly distributed one so far. Okay, we have about nine people left. So let's do five more seconds before we close. Okay. So here's our results. Check that out. Wow, almost That's straight cool. shot across the board. We're split in our, our decisions here. Bee, fly, and wasp, but our lowest, um, our, our most common guess was fly, least common was bee. And the answer is, this is in fact a bee. Wow. So that seems, that's probably surprising to some folks. So let's take a look at this next slide, which will um, guide us through some of the differences between bees and wasps. So I think to start this conversation off, one thing that we should explore is really why bees and wasps are so similar. And I'll start with a little story that um, about 120 million years ago, there was a wasp. And at this time, there wasn't very many, uh, this wasp was a predatory wasp. Like actually most wasps tend to be this way. They tend to be carnivorous where they feed on other insects. But this wasp was really having a tough time finding insects to feed on. And she had the, amazing idea to start look for, looking for protein somewhere else. And can anyone guess where she found that protein? This wasp, not in insects, but in? Plants. Plants, flowers. yes, in, in flowers. And pollen, in fact, is a very rich source of protein. And the flowers, on, on the other hand, were also really, um, yeah, this was a great um, moment for flowers as well, because what this started was a long and millions of years evolutionary arms race between these vegetarian wasps and flowers. And that's really what bees are, is they are a group, a collection of families of wasps that are vegetarian. So many features are shared between bees and wasps. Um, they both have uh, two pairs of wings. They both have these three ocelli on the top of their heads. Um, they both have long antennae. Um, and yeah, the general shape of their body, like the segmentation is often very similar. Um, and for context as well, there's another, bees and wasps are both in the same order, Hymenoptera, and there's another insect in this order. Does anyone know what that insect is? Also a descendant of wasps. Maybe you can type it in the chat or you could unmute yourself and say it out loud. Hornet. So we would still consider hornets within um, the group that we refer to as wasps. Um, I'll give you a clue. This wasp found a niche on the ground and um, most of their, and many of them actually devolved the need for wings. Ants is, thank you, Susan. Yes. So ants are another um, group of insects in the group Hymenoptera. So they also share many things in common with wasps and bees. 
but they are our land dwelling hymenopterans. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why bees and wasps are so similar. But in terms of the differences, as you can see on this slide, the diet is, is completely different. Bees are vegetarians. They get their food from flowers, whereas wasps tend to get their food from insects, either by hunting them or even parasitizing them in some cases. Um, bees in general tend to have a more like curvaceous body, whereas um, as Ken pointed out before, many wasps tend to have a pinched waist. Um, some of it's, in some species, it's very pronounced. And another difference is since bees have been adapted to collecting pollen, um, it's just the bees and specifically the female bees that have hair all over their body and especially on their scopa where, or their pollen collecting hairs on their legs or often on their abdomen for some, for a specific family of bees. And wasps don't have pollen collecting hairs. Um, wasps as carnivores tend to have more like long, thin and spiky legs for grasping onto prey. Um, whereas bees, their legs tend to be, um, have less spines on them. And yeah, so in terms of their movement, the, also we'll see very different behavior between wasps and bees. Um, wasps tend to be more traversing their habitat, searching for prey, whereas bees, they really mainly just stick to the flowers, um, especially the females. They are going to be collecting food for their offspring in the flowers and then bringing that back to their nest. Um, males, male bees, on the other hand, you may see them kind of traversing, but they're not looking for food. They're looking for the ladies. Um, so yeah, that's, so that's one thing like, and, and many folks like, um, get confused with wasps and bees as I'm sure, um, some of us here and, and some of our friends may as well. Um, but bees tend to be, they tend to not bother us as much as certain wasp species do. It's specifically the social wasps, like the paper wasps that we saw in the beginning that are the ones that tend to be, um, have more interactions with humans, especially later in the summer. Yeah, oh, and one other thing, just a note down here is that some wasp species have twitchy antennae. And you'll see that as you start to observe um, wasps on flowers more often. Okay, and here's just a, um, a side by side of these two insects. We have the bee on the left and the wasp on the right. And yeah, you can start to see some differences now. Does anyone, can anyone now tell me like what on the left, um, what tells you that the insect on the left is a bee compared to the one on the right? Has two sets of wings. Yeah, two sets. They actually both have two sets of wings, mind you. So the one on the right, um, it the, the wings are just folded. You can see a top wing here and a bottom wing here. Yeah, so we see the curvaceous, the, the hairy body. And also these, um, this is a, this type of indentation. I forget the scientific word for it, but this is more common on certain wasp species. Um, another thing is if you were to zoom in on one of these hairs on this bee, you would see it, it would look kind of like a feather. They're called plumos hairs, whereas wasp hairs tend to be just straight like this. So if you look at a, these insects under a microscope, that's another way to tell apart um, the two. And that's very helpful for these. There's some really tiny bees and tiny wasps that are little black ones that are really tricky to tell apart. Um, okay, so, and size of eyes. Oh, that's a good point. So that I'd say wasp eyes and bee eyes are pretty similar in, in their look, um, but this wasp on the right, its head is just facing down. So it's not the best picture, but I just wanted to show in these photos that First of all, yeah, there's green wasps and there's green bees. And uh, they, yeah, they, both of these um, are actually pretty common in um, our ecosystems here locally. So once you start keeping an eye out, you might be able to spot some. Um, you can see that the, that the legs on the bee are hairier, so to speak, yes. than, than the wasps. 
Yeah. 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 So all over the body, we see hair and specifically for this, um, this helic, um, this bee in the family helictidae, it has these um, scopa on its legs. So this is where this female bee would be carrying her pollen, but also sometimes pollen gets caught on other parts of the body as well. Um, this is another really interesting feature. These three um, simple eyes called ocelli, uh, they are found on both wasps and bees. You can see this wasp has the two here. It would have one more right about here if we could see the top of its head. So yeah, note that for later. Okay, next one. Um, let's open up the poll, Brian. Bee, fly, or wasp? And yes, this gold feature here is another insect pin. We'll do five more seconds. Okay, we are going to close the poll now. Um, there you go. So let's share our results. Ooh, y'all are quick learners. This one, <laughs> 27 out of 32 said it was a bee. And uh, five out of 32 said it was a fly, which kudos to y'all because this is the most common, it's very, this insect is very commonly confused for a fly, but it is in fact a bee. Um, and does anyone know the common name of this bee? Some folks may be stewarding this bee in their backyards. It's a mason bee. It sure is. Yeah, this is Osmia lignaria, the blue orchard mason bee. Yeah, many, Steve, Jim, Sunette all chimed in and said the same as well. Yes, our blue orchard mason bee. She's got tons of hair all over her body. Um, and if you were to look at the underside of her abdomen, you would also see a dense collection of hairs because that's where this bee carries her pollen. Okay, so. Next one here. Oh, whoops. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's open up the next poll, Brian. Bee, fly, or wasp? We have a waiting on about 10 more folks. So let's do five more seconds. Oh, oops, I drew on the screen there. I don't know how, oh. Oh, is that me or is that Maurice? I see Maurice's name beside there. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna end the poll. Maurice, please stop doodling on my screen. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll share the results. Okay, so 20, uh, just over two thirds of us thought this was, felt this was a bee. Um, eight out of 33 felt it was a fly and a few of us thought it was a wasp. The answer is not a bee, it, this is in fact a fly. So I'd love to hear from folks who thought it was a bee or you know what? Um, yeah, let's hear from folks who thought it was a bee. What made you think it was a bee? You can type in the chat or unmute yourself for a few seconds. Oh, it was hairy all over. It's hairy all over. The do Steve says the doodling. Yeah, yeah. Flat, um, bees tend to doodle sometimes, I guess. <laughs> the coloration, yeah. So that does look very bee-like. Um, so now I'd love to hear from folks who knew this was a fly. How, how could you tell? The it doesn't, eyes. it doesn't have the three, um, little eyes, the ocelli. I'll type that in the chat. 
or sell that. That's what they're, they're called. Doesn't have much of the, of antenna, not the long antenna. Yeah, check that out. It's just got these little wispy things here. Okay. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, oh, I almost skipped to the left. Oh, no, no one saw that, right? No one saw that. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, so this one does tend to stump people and it, it looks, it, this is a, a type of bee mimicking fly. Um, and what type of bee does this look a lot like to folks who, who guess, does anyone? Yeah, to me, it looks, it has a close representation to a specific kind of bee. A honeybee, yeah. So this fly does a really good job of mimicking honeybees. Um, and it's also a pollinator. So you will see it visiting um, flowers very often. And we'll chat a little bit about that later. So hopefully some folks were not paying attention to my little foot there, but let's start the new poll on this one. Bee or not a bee or bee fly or wasp. Okay. So um, I'm going to give it about five more seconds. Okay. And so, yeah, about 10 of us thought it was a bee. Um, many of us thought it was a fly. And a few of us thought it was a wasp. This one is not a bee. It is a type of fly. Yeah. So um, we're going to, I realize actually that um, I'm a little behind. So we're going to jump right into this next conversation here of, okay, how do we tell apart bees um, and flies? So bees and flies aren't as closely related as, oh, I'm not sure if folks saw the results, but I'll, I'll share those quickly before I dive in. Okay. So Bees and flies aren't as closely related as bees and wasps, but they do have certain similarities. And does anyone know why um, bees and flies look sometimes look like one another? There's a type of word I'm looking for here. Specifically, why does a, a how did it come to be that a fly ended up looking like a wasp? I mean, a fly ended up looking like a bee. Some of them actually do look like wasps as well. To, to fool their predators? Yes, that's spot on. To fool their predators. And Sonette in the chat said mimicry. And yes, specifically um, a type of mimicry called Batesian mimicry. Uh, and yeah, so it wasn't just one day that a fly woke up and put on a bee suit. Um, this is a process that's happened over millions of years as well. And um, basically how it has worked is that flies that were visiting flowers, um, they were naturally selected for the ones that tended to look like bees, which predators knew to be our stinging like yellow and black insects. Those ones were less likely to be predated on. So over time, that's really what drew the evolution of this group of flies to look like bees. Um, yeah, and so you can see that um, in the table here, some differences. Bees tend to have long antennae, so their antennae would stick way up above their head. Fly antennae tend to be really stubby, either like little feathers for the males, or some species just have little wisps like this. Another main difference is the number of wings. So bees have two pairs of wings, whereas flies only have one pair. And flies actually also have this, these secondary appendages just behind their wings um, that are called halteres. And they're actually remnant wings, kind of like we have a tailbone that used to be our tail. Flies have halteres that used to be wings. 
and bees as since they are well adapted to carrying pollen have pollen collecting hairs on their legs or abdomen and flies don't have those pollen collecting hairs though they do sometimes tend to be hairy as we've seen um, and another huge difference is that bees their eyes tend to be on the side of their head whereas fly eyes are really big they tend to really take up almost their entire head um, and yeah so that's another main way to tell them apart but one exception to that rule is some male bees especially um, certain bumblebee species as well as honeybees their eyes also do tend to be big so sometimes they can trick you with that feature and yeah you can see on the photo here like this bee has really long antennae this fly here has these little tiny wisps and the big eyes yeah okay So, oh, and here's a, a side by side. Oh, I realize I must have missed this one, but here is a photo of a bumblebee. Um, and we had a conversation just before about this. Uh, um, I forget who it was, but they saw what they thought was a bee at the beginning of the year, but it was the year, but it was um, probably a close relative of this fly right here. Um, and you can see, check out the, out the difference between the eyes as well as the antennae, um, very significant. Also the shape of the wings, the flies tend to have almost like this loose triangle shape. Um, and, and actually, I guess this bee also is showing a triangle shape too, but they have just one pair of wings, whereas bees have two, as you can see on this bee right here. Okay, so, um, okay, good. We're on our very last one. This is, um, a tricky one. So I'm going to throw it in there and I'm going to, this is going to be a rapid round because we got to move through this really quickly. So um, let's start the poll and I'll give y'all 10 seconds to um, share your guess as to what this insect is. Three, two, one poll. Cool. Okay, so most of us selected wasps, um, a few bee and a couple flies. This is in fact a bee. And I threw this in here just to as a quick reminder that nature never likes to um, fit into our little boxes, does it? Uh, this is a type of bee that actually um, it doesn't, so it, rather than having pollen collecting hairs on the outside of its body, it actually has an organ on the inside, a, um, called a crop, kind of similar to birds. And it's, that's where it stores its pollen internally, rather than on the outside of its body. So you can see it's relative, doesn't have much hair, um, almost looks superficially like a wasp, but it is in fact a bee, our, our cellophane bee. So yeah, that is bee or not a bee. Um, I'm going to skip that because we're asking questions on the way. And I'm actually, I'm going to skip through this, but um, we're going to dive here into chatting about honeybees, just because these are the bees that many of us um, often are the first bees that we learn about. And learning about honeybees is a little deceptive because as some folks probably know, they're not native to here. Um, they, and they are a domesticated species. Um, and honeybees are actually quite different. They're kind of the odd ones out uh, compared to the bees that are native to here. They're social, they make honey. Um, and as we'll see, that's, yeah, these are pretty unique characteristics compared to our native bees. And here's a quick map um, showing some of the diversity of bees in our province. Um, this graph says that there is around 400 species, but um, local bee taxonomists that I know say that that number is actually much greater, probably closer to 600. Um, and the Southern interior or the Okanagan is really uh, where a ton of our bees are located. 
they, they really love those um, dry habitats and they like to nest um, in the sandier soils in this region. And there's also such a high diversity of plants in this area that bees are attracted to. These are all, they also come in all colors of the rainbow. And these are all photos of bees that are found in our province. Um, and most of them, except this one and this one are all found in the lower mainland. So yeah, we have red bees, bees with orange, green, blue, even dark blue. And native bees, most of them are social and some of them are solitary. Oh, sorry, most of them are, are solitary and, and only a few are social. It's primarily our bumblebees that are um, the social bees. And most of our native bees, they nest in cavities and in the ground. And I actually have, um, or actually here on the left here, we have a bee that's ex excavating the stem, the pithy stem of a plant. Um, there's bees such as the group Serotina that tend to nest in these spaces. Um, here in the middle, we have an Osmia lignaria male, um, and he, they tend to nest in cavities. I didn't have a, a picture of a natural cavity, but in nature, this could be hollow stems or under um, bark that's falling off of logs or trees. Um, also, some of these bees nest in, in the ground as well. And many of our bees are ground nesting species. Oh, so here's a little video I would wanted to share of a bee that is um, accessing her nest underground. And this is just the lawn um, on the corner of my block, actually. There she goes. Yeah, so most folks don't realize this, but lawns are actually a great place to find bees. If you see, um, they really like the, the patchy lawns with lots of weeds in them. So if you see a lawn that has, um, yeah, little patchy areas, take a closer look and just get down on the ground level and see if you can see the bees flying around. At this time of year, you see a lot of males that have emerged from their nests and are searching for the females. Oh, okay, on to the next slide. Here's a quick um, picture of the native bee life cycle. So most of our native bees are annual. So they just have a one year life cycle. Um, and depending on the different species, they will emerge at different times of year. Um, Osmia lignaria, for example, is a spring, a very early spring bee. So they've already started to emerge. And the first thing they'll do is search out a nest where they will then start to, um, for, then they will, the females will mate and they will start to forage for pollen. They will lay an egg on that ball of pollen. And then um, that baby bee will hatch out of the egg and eat the ball of pollen. And once they've ate their fill, they will um, then undergo metamorphosis inside the cocoon. And that is where the, this little grubby baby bee larvae will uh, um, transform into the adult bees that we know and recognize. Um, oh, I just see I'm missing a few comments here. John said, I would assume manicured lawns are very poor habitat for bees compared to nature scapes due to their nesting habits. Kelowna has a bee ambassador program to encourage homeowners to set aside some suitable native plants and portion of their lawn to increase the ability of bees to travel across the city. That's so neat. Yeah, the connectivity of habitats is so important for bees. Um, I just wanted, I just added this uh, slide in here about how to tell apart feel, females and male bees. Um, and this is a really neat thing that is helpful when you see bing, bees in the wild because if you can tell apart a male bee from a female bee, you could actually. Um, yeah, you can, you can know which, which bees will have the capacity to sting you and which won't. So um, only as 
some folks here may know, only female bees hold, have stingers. So if you were to look closely at their abdomen, this is very apparent on bumblebees, you'll see that it comes to a point at the end. And the end of a male bee's abdomen tends to be more blunted. Um, also, female bees have the scopa or the pollen collecting hairs, male bees don't. And male bees actually tend to have facial hair. I want to show you this on um, this slide. Oh, back here, it showed it really good. So here is a male blue orchid mason bee. And you can see he's got a little mustache. That's actually really common on certain species of bee for the males to have facial hair. And oh, um, I messed this up, but the females actually have uh, 12 antennal segments and the males have 13, so one extra segment, that's a microscope feature. And same with abdominal segments, males also have one more. And here's just some photos of two bumblebees of the same species, our Bombus vancouverensis. And you can see here just the difference between the male end of the abdomen is more blunted, the females is more pointed. Okay, now, I realize I'm a bit behind here. So, and these next few slides are quite informative. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'll share this presentation with folks. Um, it goes through a lot of the um, really helpful identifying characteristics of the different bee functional groups of bees, but they are very self-explanatory and um, amazing resources. So I'll have, give a quick, um, flick through them so you can see them on the slides and or on the presentation and maybe you can pause it while um, you're reviewing the presentation as well. Bumblebees, we have our hairy belly bees. This is um, Megachile up here, Osmia right here, Amphidium manicatum, which is actually an introduced species. Um, we have the large mandibles, in, in hairy belly bees. And these are all in the family Megachelidae. Um, pollen pants bees, this is actually many different families. So more of a functional grouping rather than a taxonomic one. Um, and these bees, we group them because they tend to have pollen on their legs. Sometimes it's in the form of a pants. Sometimes it's just a little pocket. Sometimes it's kind of like capris as well. Um, and here is just a collection of some shout outs to some other neat bees, like our um, cellophane bees that we saw in the game. And these actually are super interesting, um, these kleptoparasitic bees. So some folks here may have heard of cuckoo birds, which move into the, the net where where the females will lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. We have a similar um, evolutionary um, trait in, in several different groups of bees. And um, research has shown that this has actually evolved independently in several different groups. Um, and they believe it's, it evolved in places where resources were really limited. So, um, those mother bees, instead of providing for their young, they have learned to lay their eggs in the, in the nests of other bees. So the, those female bees provide for their young instead. And this coleoxis here, you can see she's got a very pointed abdomen and that's for breaking through the walls um, of the leaf cutter bees that she tends to lay her eggs with. And yeah, so here is that slide again. Um, I will share the answers. So number one is a fly. Number two here is a bumblebee. So that's our first bee. Um, three is a butterfly or a moth. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Four is a bee. Um, five is an orthopteran. Number six is another bee. So two, four, six. Seven, eight, and ten are all bees. Yeah, does anyone have any quick questions about the insects on this slide before I move on? Anyone curious about this one, number nine? We usually get a few questions about this one. Does anyone know what this insect is? You could type it in the chat or say it out loud. 
to give you a clue, it is a relative of a bee. It's an ant. Thank you, Bruce. And yes, this and Brian, this is a velvet ant. So they're they're actually a type of wasp where the females have devolved wings. So they are terrestrial, but the males have wings. And you can't we I've never seen one in the lower mainland, but I know you can see them on the islands as well as um, in the interior. Okay, now a quick plug for where you can learn more and dive deeper into your bee learnings. Um, please join our project on iNaturalist, the Native Bee Society Bee Tracker. And um, as Victoria shared, there's so many interesting statistics that you can check in on um, about the different distributions um, of bees in our province. And yeah, we always love getting new records from naturalists like y'all um, and yeah it's an amazing source of learning um, that we love to share uh, with our community so yeah please join and contribute oh can, can someone oh yeah there we go someone unmuted for a second and yeah as I, I mentioned these a bit at the beginning but our native bee study group this happens on the fourth Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m um, and is hosted by one of our directors, Bonnie, who's a wonderful bee taxonomist, and um, also the Master Melatologist program. As I mentioned, we have a BC cohort, and Link here is also one of our directors who has done extensive um, pollinator research in the province. And finally, Bumblebee Watch. So Bumblebee Watch is a lesser known citizen science app that is really excellent for helping with bumblebee identification specifically. And it has um, a clickable like identification guide where you can, if you have a photo of a bee, a bumblebee, actually make sure you get many different photos. You wanna have a photo of the face, the, the back of the thorax, um, and multiple angles of the body. And that will help you determine the species by clicking on the different traits that you see. And it'll help narrow down your list to um, the bees that have those traits, but also the ones that are, are um, present in the region that you observed it. Okay, and that is the end. Um, oh, bonus question. Does anyone recognize this bee on this fireweed here? Some of our bumblebee folks? I, yeah, I believe this to be Melanopygus, but I need to also verify because I took it in the Yukon. Um, but if it, yeah, it does look a lot like Melanopygus to me, the one, one that we also have in the lower main then. Um, but yeah, yeah, any other questions? I know we're a bit over time. As we're, I, we're, as we're, we're good, we're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had to skip over those the functional group slides a little bit. Um, but yeah, hopefully you can check in on them later. Any questions out there? Do There's all a bees flesh question. Uh, do only honeybees <laughs> make honey? Ooh, well, um, so two part answer. Around here, yes. So not actually locally, none of our native bees produced honey. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Apis mellifera is an introduced species that does make honey locally. So, but if you were to visit other places of the world, like Central and South America, as well as Australia, Africa, um, there are many different species of bees that do produce honey in varying amounts. Mm -hmm. Marika, maybe you could um, stop sharing your screen. Oh, so yes. then that's a thank you. I will stop yeah. the share. Great. I think we should explore a few solutions. Grandma was suggesting catch when you're. So do, we oh, have, so do we have any more questions for Marika? What are the biggest challenges to bee survival from John in the chat? Um, okay. So, yeah, many folks like 
First of all, something I should have mentioned on the honeybee slide is that like many folks feel have may have heard that honeybees are endangered, but that's actually a bit of a misrepresentation in the media. Um, honeybees aren't a threatened species because they are domesticated and managed by humans. Um, they do face certain challenges to survival, especially in our climate, but with different interventions, they are able to survive. Um, but our native bees, yes, they do face a certain number of threats. Um, so the, some of the major ones are habitat loss, habitat degradation, um, exposure to pesticides, um, also disease transmission. Um, and that can be some, um, some diseases have been observed to be, have been tr transmitted between say like um, domesticated bumblebees and wild bumblebees. Um, and what else, am I missing any big ones? Um, yeah, and those are the main ones that come to mind right now, but um, the main, the best way that we can support bees is to conserve as well as um, create more habitat for them. So planting flowers, and making sure you have lots of nesting sites um, in the spaces that you steward. And right. Maurice, oh, Maurice got a question. Maurice has their hand up. Hey, um, yeah, so as for bees, um, as much as the honeybees are domesticated, why haven't they just reached out on their own and just created their own little honey hives? And and I thought this was a case like say in Colorado, I, I, I don't know if it was, uh, I was misled, but uh, the wild, the wild, what was the, the killer bees that were actually creating honey at the same time? Uh, I don't know if this was a, a wild species or an offset or, or whether uh, honeybees can in fact somehow um, create um, uh, a new, breed on their own in, in uh, whether there would be any need for that or whether this was all a contrived thing. It's um, I this you could probably talk forever on 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 domesticated uh, honey that's being derived from bees, obviously. So, mm -hmm. well, OK, to, so to answer your first question. Um, so can honeybees survive in the wild? And my answer to that would be probably not that well. Um, I have seen like some honeybees like try to survive outside of a managed colony. Like at the garden I work at, they moved into a wall, for example. Um, and they, that colony wasn't able to survive the season and the winter. And I think um, like I'm not a, a beekeeper anymore and there's other people who could have way more expertise on this than me, but to my understanding, honeybees really struggle to survive in our climate without any support from humans because um, the habitats that they're native to tend to be a bit warmer and drier. Um, so because it's so moist and wet here, they become more susceptible to different pests and diseases. Um, also, yeah, so it is a challenge for honeybees to survive and naturalize in the wild here. Um, and beekeepers do have to provide lots of different support for them, like um, pest management and often sometimes supplemental food in the winter if they struggle, if their colonies are struggling. Um, also, yeah, of course, the varroa mite is a common pest that many of us may have heard of. Um, yeah, so it is it's a challenging, um, it's challenging for honeybees to survive in the wild. And as for your second one about whether honeybees can evolve, um, yeah, I don't uh, evolve into a new species. I don't really know the answer to that, but I don't think it's likely over such a small time scale. And um, but honeybee colonies do, um, they can split and um, actually swarm. So like one colony can, um, the, the old queen will leave 
if, if it gets really crowded or if it's at the right time of year, the old queen leaves and the part of the colony that stays behind will start, will create a new queen and they will form an, a separate colony. So that's kind of a way that honeybees reproduce. Um, okay, so does that answer your questions pretty well, Marie? Yeah, it does. And that was the next person just put in the chat a question to follow that up because that's been on my mind as well. Oh, domesticated bumblebees. Um, so, Whether they're a threat to our natu natural bee populations. Okay, so, well, wait, let's, let's start with John's up here. So what are, uh, oh, sorry, Nora's, you mentioned domesticated bumblebees. What are those? So yeah, it's not only honeybees that are domesticated. Um, there are several species of bumblebees that are domesticated and they're particularly used in greenhouse pollination um, for different, to my understanding, for different types of nightshades. So like peppers and tomatoes. Um, and there's actually a species of bee that's arrived here called Bombus impatiens, the Eastern bumblebee that they believe has established due to escaping out of greenhouses, likely in Delta or Richmond. Um, and it's become actually very common here. It's one of the most common bees, bumblebees that we see, especially late in the summer. Um, so yeah, there are domesticated bumblebees. There's also, mason bees are also um, domesticated, um, often for uh, orchard pollination. And so are some leaf cutter bee species as well. Um, okay, and how many species of bees are found in the lower mainland? That is a great question. And I feel like that's a study that needs to happen soon. Um, lots of the research that I found on that is pretty outdated. So maybe a project for the Native Bee Society to take on. Um, but, oh, actually, you know what? That map that I have, I can quickly click back to it. That would have been from some of Elizabeth Ellie's research. And I do think it had, had a number. It said, oh, in the Georgia depression, which we are a part of, which also extends um, to like the west coast of the island. Oh, sorry, the east coast of the island. There's around 150 species. So we do, and that's compared to the interior, which has about 400 species. So we do have a, a relatively lower diversity of bees here compared to the interior. Um, okay, our, oh, Martha sent me a direct message asking, are all bees pollinators? What about wasps and where do hornets fit in? So are all bees pollinators? Um, the answer is like some are more effective than others. Uh, the most effective bees are our hairiest, like female bees. Um, male bees don't, so the difference um, in their life histories is that female bees, they are the ones that provide, do all the provisioning for their young. So they are actively visiting and, and actively collecting pollen off of flowers. Male bees fall into the category of what um, we can call passive pollinators. So they're visiting flowers mainly for nectar as a source of energy, and they just happen to brush pollen on them. Um, also, some of the smaller bees tend, that are, have less hair on their bodies tend to be less effective pollinators than the ones that are larger and hairier, like bumblebees. Um, and what, okay, Linda asks, at what daytime temperature do bees quit pollinating? Bees tend to be active at the warmest times of day. So um, to my understanding, uh, there may be some exceptions to that actually, but typically bees are most active, I'd say between like 11 and 2 p.m. And that's when typically like bee researchers tend to sample bees during those hours. Um, and another question from John. Um, I understand mason bees are much more efficient at pollination as they don't have to return to a hive. Is that so? Ooh, great point, John. So yes, um, mason bees are very efficient at pollination. Um, and actually a stat that I learned from Lori Weidenhammer's book is that to provide for one egg, um, a female bee will visit over around 700 flowers. Actually, I think it's 800 flowers 
for one offspring. And a mason bee tends to lay about um, 10 to 14 eggs in her lifetime. So if you multiply 800 by 14, that's one mason bee. Um, and I've also read a stat somewhere that mason bees are, are about 10, one mason bee is 10 times more efficient than a honeybee at pollination as well. Um, oh, Jeff asks any tips for identifying bees, how to photograph handling bees? Oh, great question. So um, yeah, bees can be tricky because sometimes they don't like to pose for our photos. Um, one of the best ways to get photos of bees for identification is to, to catch them um, in a jar or a, there's, you can get small um, vials at different entomological suppliers. I was just trying to see if I have one nearby, but I don't. Um, but yeah, they're about this big and, and the smaller vials are a little better because you can, um, the bee doesn't have as much room to move around so you can get better angles and photos. Um, there, you can also, I think just another piece of advice I'd offer to beginner bee photographers is rather than chasing the bees around, the best way to get photos is actually to just plop yourself in front of a plant and wait for the bees to come. Um, yeah, because otherwise your photos tend to be shaky or it's, yeah, the bees are always faster. So yeah, staying in one spot and focusing on a flower that you know is um, being actively visited is a good strategy. Okay, and I know I'm well over time now. Maybe one more question. Oh, Maurice, did you raise your hand again or was that there from before? <laughs> again? Just quickly, I've seen yeah. two bumblebees like within one mile and one happens was in my community garden but i we were we have a, a group with mason bees and we're using uh not weed tubes to to have them they're easy to crack open and release and it's quite a beautiful share and they're sharing with us but um i have now i think i miss uh, paper wasps, I believe, small hive of just about this big in the corners of the hothouse with dangly leaves and they just kind of, they do totally keep them themselves and apparently keep down the cabbage moths, which are wonderful and we've had big heads of cabbage, but I wanted to know if, if, if they're going to interfere with the doings of the mason bees. And I don't know how, or how well the mason bees necessarily do in the garden, but they, we do have an orchard and um, whether they should be, um, whether they, do they cohabitate well or, or do they, uh, do, or do the wasps predate on, on, on the uh, mason bees? Mm, that's a great question. And I don't know, like, a definitive answer, but I'll give you my best guess. And that would be that like, I, I've never seen, um, I've never seen active predation of mason bees by, by paper wasps, but there are certain wasps that are very effective at pre predating mason bees. And those are actually um, parasitic wasps. So they're a type of wasp that will actually enter into the mason bee um, nest and like will um, actually they lay their eggs even through depending on the type of house you have they'll lay their eggs through um, the side of the nest and actually lay them inside um, the bee developing bees cocoon so then the parasitoid wasp will actually eat that bee from the inside and um, if you ever are cleaning those of us here who clean mason bee uh, cocoons have probably met these wasps before and what will happen is instead of a bee hatching out you'll usually get eight to ten little tiny wasps hatching out and they are very um, successful predators of mason bees but as for paper wasps I have seen them actually actively predate honeybees colonies uh, towards the end of the summer so they will actually like enter into the hive especially if it's a sickly hive and um, will yeah feed on like the 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 weaker um and and also the larvae of the bees if they can get inside yeah 
You're obviously a bee lover as much as. <laughs> <laughs> I do love yeah. bees. Yeah, I do love bees. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. Of course. Well, thank you, Mark. It's uh, fabulous. And there was a, a lot of interest from, from everybody uh, on your topic and that's so absolutely incredible. So. So, um, yes, Marika, you know, I think we could listen to you talking about bees all evening. Uh, <laughs> it was so interesting. I just loved your description of how bees are vegetarian wasps. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard yeah. that said before, and it just made everything so clear. I think it was really, really, really interesting thought. And I just also wanted to say, you know, I was always really kind of attuned more to birds and it's only fairly recently that I got interested in bees and so a whole new world has opened up to me actually a world that's I think uh, more complex than mm -hmm. um, the bird watching world and just totally totally fascinating so thank you so much uh, for coming this evening and uh, giving us this lovely description of um, how we can start to identify uh, some of our local bees. We really greatly appreciate you doing this, Marika. Thank, so thank you, you so very much, much for having me. I feel very grateful to be here. Yeah, there's so, it was great. so much energy to, to share about bees and, and learn from other folks who are excited about them too. Yeah. So, thank you. You're getting us excited about <laughs> Yeah, it was great. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, thank you so very much. Thank and I'll you. pass I'll pass the mic over to Brian now. Perfect. Um, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Ian. Um, and Marika, you're quite welcome to stick around if you wish. Uh, we're just going to have some wildlife sightings that have been submitted by the members of uh, the BMN team, and uh, they will uh, comment on them. And so you're quite welcome to stay with us. Okay. So okay, uh, thanks for everybody who submitted their sightings for this month. Totally appreciated. And I will now share my screen. And here we go. Can everybody see my screen? The wildlife yep. gallery? Yes. Hey. Okay. So let's go. Let's hope everybody is uh, on board that has submitted their photos. I'm pretty sure they have. Okay. First up, uh, we have Susan Lundell. Okay. I have Mother Goose back. <laughs> Um, on nesting on this little island in the pond. I first saw it two years ago and uh, it wasn't there last year. So now she's back nesting and I'm looking very forward to seeing the whole process. Like eventually she'll pluck out feathers and feather her nest. And um, last year I saw the eggs in the process of hatching and the little babies. And interesting also the, the gander is with her for a, quite a while when they're swimming around and feeding, but then the ganders go elsewhere while she's nesting and come and it comes back just before the eggs hatch. Hmm. And this is a Townsend solitaire. Um, I actually have two around and it's hmm. been in my garden for uh, about a week now. So, um, oh, you I lucky thing. It's the fourth or fifth I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And it's there every day. Um, I don't know if it, they might nest. Apparently they build nests on the ground and they like to build them in, in like banks with overhangs. And I don't know if there's anything like that around here, but they, they could do it. They could nest just on the ground somewhere. So I might be lucky. Wow. Okay. And the mandarin duck is back. Here it is kind of sleeping. It's on a different pond right now. It used to be on Oxbow Lake and now it's it's come down to another pond in Coquitlam River Park. But it's still around. And I've got a beaver in the pond right behind my house. And it seems to be building a lodge again. And it's built a dam. Um, so they haven't been in this particular pond for over 10 years. So I'm, I'm quite pleased to have them back. I just hope they don't do too much damage. The level of the pond is already rising. Wow. Awesome. Ron. Oh. Ron, you submitted three photos. I've put them in the order I think you meant them to be. So we'll start with the first one. Yes, that's right. Thank you. 
Um, this is a long, uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> Alouette. The Alouette River. Yeah, um, I had noticed this uh, heron colony uh, before and the nests are relatively small. So I wasn't sure if maybe it's a, a new colony. Um, there was six nests and 11 birds hanging around there. So they're pretty serious. And the interesting thing about this is it's, it's so accessible. Uh, could you go to the next uh, picture? Um, so you can see the, on the left, the Pitt River Bridge and the, uh, the, the tack on the right shows the location of the, of the colony. Uh, yeah. Um, and then the next slide is just a little bit closer than that. So the red star shows where the, the colony is located. Uh, if you see the, the green point, there's a parking lot there for dike access. You can, uh, so you can park very close to the colony. There are even benches along the dike. So it would be a great place if uh, someone was interested in just sitting and observing. Um, has anyone been aware of that particular um, colony up, up till now? Uh, I was cycling past there the other day, last week actually, and there's quite a bit of action there. We saw a, a few flying in and out. Where it says uh, Maple Ridge Dyke Dog Park, there's a gate there mm -hmm. and you can uh, wander down and go right to the Alouette uh, River. It's very nice and quiet there. I don't know if I should be advertising this on a <laughs> hot summer day in the future. That might be a great place just to go wading. It's very nice there. Uh, it also floods. Uh, I have seen um, that dog park underwater. So it, yeah, the cyclists uh, go past there quite frequently. It's quite a nice place. Good spotting. Have you been aware of that colony there uh, last year, for example? I have I seen, last year I saw the nests, but I did not see any birds, but I might not have been cycling there at the right time of the year. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, I've had uh, some some um, interesting sightings uh, about 15 kilometers east of Mission along Highway 7. I saw in a field considerably more than 100 trumpeter swans. Wow. Uh, I've seen them up there in that direction before, but never in those kind of numbers. Um, Along the dike, uh, along the Pitt River, uh, a, a week ago, I spotted a pair of mountain bluebirds, mm. which I understand don't nest in this area. Um, so they must have been migrating through. Um, just unbelievable color um, on the male. I, when I, I didn't pay attention to it at first because I thought it was a discarded piece of plastic. The color was so brilliant. And um, just this evening at dinner time, I saw for the first time this year an absolutely spectacular male Rufus hummingbird. And that's a first nice. for me. Uh, I have a red flowering current that's in full flower now. And tomorrow I will be sitting out there for the entire day with the camera in my hand, <laughs> hoping that that uh, that Rufus shows up again. That's so it's dedication. been a pretty exciting time. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you, Ron. Thank yeah. You. Good luck with getting that photo. Yeah. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, John, a topical subject. Please. Oh, yes. This is my uh, <laughs> late but still <laughs> valiant effort to try to get some bees of Lakeburn. And it was interesting that uh, what they were feeding on, I think those are pussy willows. And to see them um, actually flying around in relatively cold weather was quite a surprise. Okay, fabulous shots too, John. Thank you. Do we know what kind of bees those were? Are they humming, um, honey bees or bumblebees? I think Rico, you're up. <laughs> bumblebees. <laughs> Bumblebees. Yeah. I think we can agree on bumblebees. 
it's not often I get a chance to photograph in the wild, relative wild, a very endangered and threatened species in British Columbia. And it just so happened uh, during one of our uh, colony farm bird walks, I decided to go a little bit further because I realized that the stinging nettles were coming out. And at Colony Farm, there's a symbiotic relationship between the stinging nettles and the Oregon forest snail, which is quite an endangered species. There's very few spots in British Columbia that these forest snails have been observed. And I carefully staying on the trail, I had a, a zoom lens with a macro feature and without disturbing them, I was able to capture what I initially thought was later confirmed to be the Oregon forest snail. And a couple of signs to differentiate this from the brown lip snail is the picture on the right. You can see the what's, what's called the belly button. It has quite a prominent any belly button apparently compared to other snails. And then on the left, they also have around the outside of the shell, quite a predominant uh, feature there. It's quite a lip on there. So it was just fascinating to see this animal that's eating away at the stinging nettle. And this is uh, not so much wildlife, except we were a little bit wild getting up early in the morning to, to go and do something relatively new. Uh, we were pleased that Sarah, our Education Conservation Committee Chair for BMN, had arranged for a graduate student, uh, Cheryl Rees, to do an invertebrate, a uh, macroinvertebrate survey. And there is, as you can see, quite a few people that turned out that were quite keen. And this is at Como Lake, and we did two sites. And the first site is at the south end of the lake where the stream just leaves the lake. And the water quality looked quite good, and uh, sure enough, we had, uh, through Lori Austin's efforts, uh, purchased a, a, a dip net, specialized dip net, a very fine 400 micron dip net. And it was amazing just how much, and it was a good sign because they use macroinvertebrates as a bioindicator of stream health. And certainly this section of the lake produced quite a few macroinvertebrates. And you can see here in the ice cube tray, just a, a collection of some of the macroinvertebrates. And it was really nice to see uh, caddis flies, both in the grub and the larvae state where they actually take bits of wood and encase themselves. They build a little shell for themselves to protect themselves. And I had, first thought I was seeing things, but this is almost looking like a little shrimp or prawn, and it's called a side swimmer or a scud. And once again, it's a sign of a reasonably healthy stream. And I found this a really interesting way uh, to determine what is the health of a stream. So we're hoping to expand our little program. We also did on the same day a survey at the other end of the uh, Como Lake, and unfortunately, the water quality there is right where the storm water enters the lake. Uh, we didn't find a reasonable stretch of water to do, to do a representative sampling. You need a, a bit of a riffle and a reasonable flow. And we weren't surprised when we had far less diversity and abundance of invertebrate at that end of the lake. And I had the pleasure uh, last year of working with uh, Cleon and Brian uh, with the Port Moody Rotary Club, and they designed a, a wonderful interpretive trail at West Hill Park. It's now called the Rotary Trail. And as part of that, we have five different locations where we've put up nest boxes built by Gord Mayenberg on behalf of the club. And we inspected. I, I went along with Ian and Brian, and I had a chance to watch them as they inspected various uh, nest boxes. And the one that certainly showed that there was an occupant over the winter, and even recently, was our Northern Flicker box. And based on, we put up another Flicker box at a school in Coquitlam, and within a day of putting up the Flicker box, it was inhabited by a pair of Flickers. 
but in this case, I think the flicker may have first come, but he, much to our surprise, there was another resident that had taken over and I got this shot. I was just fortunate, one of those things that it's an Eastern gray squirrel coming out of the box. And I'm wondering if it's a female that actually has young in there. We were very careful. Ian was really good about just opening the box slightly to see that in fact there was nesting material in there. And then we quickly closed the box. So even though an Eastern gray squirrel is a non-native species, we thought as an educational prop, it would be wonderful for any groups, uh, particularly children to be able to see wildlife in this little park. It's a wonderful interpretation trail. And my entries to the wildlife sightings, we have here, <laughs> I come across some rare ground scuffing humanoids the other day, and uh, they're all very friendly. So, uh, and they didn't scurry away when I happened across them. But um, yes, uh, just an example here of the work that uh, Jim and Loretta Tissell have, uh, have headed up, and that's the uh, cleaning up and rejuvenation of the reflection um, area of around Blakeburn Lagoons. And uh, a bunch of us the other day, uh, thanks to Loretta and Jim, um, have uh, cleaned it up. These were some early photos, so it, I, I, it looks even better now. But um, just some fabulous work and some great community spirited activity to uh, to help the city make our local area just look uh, great for self reflection and just some solitude and yeah just fabulous work. Thank you, Loretta and Jim, for mm -hmm. for organising that. And that's all, folks. Uh, thank you so much for submitting your photos, and we uh, look forward to more photos being submitted for next month. And uh, once again, we'll uh, have some uh, wildlife sightings. Thank you all. Thanks, Brian. So unless anybody has any questions, we'll um, bring the meeting to a close or comments. Um, just as a reminder, our, our next meeting will be the show and share for polar bears, and that will be on Tuesday, April 19th. So thanks very much for everybody that um, tuned in and enjoyed this evening's presentation. And thank you, Marika, for, for sticking around. Thanks. I hope, yeah. hope you enjoyed our wildlife study. Yeah, that was so fun just to hear. <laughs> I love just like, yeah, your enthusiasm is infectious. And yeah, really grateful to see some of these sightings and some spots to check out when I'm out in the area. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Victoria. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Marika. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.